Hello, everybody, and welcome yet to another episode of the Nailed It Ortho podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Wendell Cole. Uh, myself and Dr. Fitz started this podcast to go over high yield orthopedic surgery topics. And today we have a little bit of a different type of episode, our hashtag ortho talk episode. And this episode actually features a very special guest. We have uh, Dr. Brian Cole out of Rush uh, University Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois. He comes and he talks to us a little bit about kind of his life experiences. We talk about leadership, um, you know, what things that make a good leader, things that make a good mentor. Uh, and we take kind of a, a little bit of a deeper dive into Dr. Cole's life and kind of upbringing and kind of where he, how he's got to where he is today. And uh, a little bit more about Dr. Cole. He has an extensive, uh, a long uh, list of accolades and things that he's done with his life. Um, but just to tell you a little bit more about him, uh, he is currently actually the president of the Arthroscopy Association of North America. He's published over um, a thousand um, articles and in, in peer-reviewed uh, publications. Um, he's published in over 10 uh, textbooks. Uh, he is also the uh, head team physician for the Chicago Bulls NBA team, um, co-team physician for the Chicago White Sox MLB team, and DePaul uh, University in Chicago. He is the section head of the Carlos Research and Restoration Center at Rush, um, specializing kind of in the treatment of arthritis and uh, biological uh, alternatives to surgery. Uh, he actually serves as the head of the orthopedic master's training program. He trains residents, fellows in sports medicine and, and research up at Rush. He has done numerous uh, national and international talks, holds several leadership positions in multiple sports societies. So uh, he actually hosts his own podcast, the Sports Medicine Weekly Podcast, where they go over you know injury prevention, sports medicine, treatment, fitness, and nutrition. So you know, he has a, a long list of things he does. He is a very busy gentleman, and we are uh, so happy that he came and, and wanted to sit down and talk with us today. So without further ado, we hope you enjoy this episode featuring Dr. Brian Cole. You are now listening to Nailed It, the orthopedic surgery podcast featuring Drs. Jay Fitz and Wendell Cole. Dr. Cole, welcome to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. So happy to have you on. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's great to join you. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this for a while. I remember, I think I first stumbled upon your name when I was a med student looking up papers and I, I kept seeing your name show up on a lot of different papers. And, and that first, I guess uh, that was my first uh, exposure to your name. So I was finally glad to actually meet you and get to talk to you as a resident. Well, I look forward to sharing some ideas with you. Yeah, and kind of what we'd like to do is first kind of just give a, a general background, just getting to know you a little bit, and then we will transition into uh, into some topics and kind of talk about leadership and talk about some work-life balance and different tips and tricks for those listening. So um, first off, just general question, uh, can you just kind of tell the people a little bit of from where, where you are, like where, where are you from, and kind of what was your childhood like growing up? Were you sit, were, were you uh, only child, you have siblings, kind of what was that environment like? So um, I live in Chicago and I grew up in the northern suburbs of Chicago. <clears throat> I have uh, 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 two brothers. Uh, we're all about three. We're three years apart, essentially, and I'm the youngest. Um, we um, when I was uh, young, we uh, my parents were together. My mom uh, recently died last year. So they've had a they enjoyed a long, uh, uh, wonderful marriage and had a very uh, I would say a close knit family that was pretty engaged. Uh, I would say fairly typical childhood growing up in the North shore of uh, Chicago, which, uh, and even, even of itself would, I would say is, uh, has, uh, the propensity to be a sort of a, a privileged upbringing, if you will. But, um, uh, I played sports when I was younger, started playing tackle football when I was in third grade and played through high school, oh, wow. almost played in college, but, I, uh, my, I'm not, I don't have a very big stature. I don't look like a football player, nor do I even look like an orthopedic surgeon, quite frankly. Um, <laughs> But uh, so, yeah, that was uh, my upbringing. My uh, mom was uh, uh, an, an avid athlete as well and uh, played golf. And uh, my father played football and swam in college. And my brothers all played sports. And, you know, that was a, a reasonable part of our upbringing. But I tended to be sort of uh, more uh, academically inclined as well compared to maybe, uh, you know, my siblings and, and, and even my parents. 
Um, okay. And, and, you know, uh, even from a very early age, knew that I wanted to go into medicine, I would say as early as even junior high. Okay. And, you know, growing up in this household, number one, being the youngest of two other brothers that played a lot of sports and having parents that played sports, are there any lessons or values that they instilled in you, you know, growing up through childhood? Um, I think that they were pretty good at giving us a uh, long enough leash uh, just to about hang, us, hang ourselves. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think that was the lesson I learned then. And it's a lesson that I currently use for my own children uh, currently. So we had a fair amount of independence, but I think there was a uh, clearly an element of trust that was um, uh, uniformly, you know, exhibited that uh, gave us enough confidence to sort of be comfortable in an independent way, but uh, to know how far we can push the envelope without making something unsafe. Yeah. And are, are there any habits that you learned picking up from playing sports that you, that you still hold on to, to this day or any things that maybe a mindset that you have or any, you know, anything that you picked up? It's a great question. And I do have an answer to that. It, I think back to uh, when I was very young, I, I, I'm only about five foot eight. And I was essentially five foot eight when I was in fourth grade. So oh, wow. I would, I was, uh, I, I grew early and stopped growing early. And so I was a really good football player when I was younger. And I knew how to play tackle football as I went through uh, high school, but everyone else kept growing around me. So I, what I learned was that um, I had to try very, very hard and uh, eliminate, essentially eliminate fear at that age to actually excel and play football for my size and stature. I was actually an offensive guard at five foot eight, but I was also uh, pretty strong and, and reasonably fast. And at that time, you would never know now by looking at me, I think I was benching about 330 to 340 pounds. Oh, wow. Uh, so strong. Uh, so I was, I, but, but that was all by perseverance and, and just working really, really hard. So, you know, there was a time when sports was super important to me. And even in, 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 in even in deference to academics in school, um, that only came kind of later in high school. But when I was younger, I didn't have, you know, it just wasn't important to me. It wasn't like I didn't do well. It just wasn't something I thought about much until later on. And um, but I what I learned from sports, however, is that to be competitive and to actually be successful, you have to try really, really hard and have to have an amazing work ethic. And it wasn't just lifting weights. It was nutrition. It was sleep. It was sort of all that stuff. So I took that very seriously. And I think I saw that if you, if you take control of the things that you can control and try to excel in those um, attributes that it can pay dividends. And I think, on, I think quite frankly, that's something that extended later on when I, when my priorities shifted towards, Hey, I'd like to be a really, really good doctor um, uh, because there's certain things I love about this profession. It's very similar because if you, in medical school and certainly residency becomes increasingly competitive and you realize that if you don't do well, it's largely because maybe you didn't put the time or effort in uh, to actually succeed. Uh, doing well, for example, academically, while it's great to be uh, uh, have things come easy to you, much like being very athletic, I don't know if I was particularly athletic. I just tried really, really hard. And I think a lot of those things, sometimes I question, I'm not sure how good at school I was I just tried really, really hard. So I did well. Yeah. It's kind of, you just had to, that constant work ethic and constant kind of that grit that you get, especially from being, you know, as you, as, as everybody aged, being a small one, not everybody. And you kind of had to, you, you know, there are others that maybe six, three, you know, two, 300 pounds that, that have that, but you know, you have to have a certain level of grit and perseverance and drive to want to, you know, make yourself better and then and, and as well as compete. And um, you mentioned a little bit earlier that you said you wanted to go into uh, that you knew you wanted to do medicine from a young age. We kind of just doing some research on it. it. Sounded like you wanted to. You can verify if this is true or not, but it sounded like you wanted to be a psychologist first when you were a kid. Is, is that correct? So if I think about the trajectory, um, I used to, there was a show, and I don't know how old you are, but there was a show called uh, Bob Newhart, and Bob Newhart was uh, a psychologist, and he was a comedian and you know, really funny and. Uh, he, his, his wife, the actress was uh, Suzanne Plachette. And uh, I, for whatever reason, I just loved that show. And he would deal with sort of common problems, but some very funny vignettes. And I used to mm. really like the concept of potentially being, uh, I, I started out being pediatrics, then I was child psychiatry. 
and then psychiatry. And then like many things, it's all about role models. And at that stage, I just never really came across the role models that, you know, made a difference to me to influence me to go that trajectory. And um, I ultimately moved into an interest in being uh, doing infertility ob And um, again, role models play a very important uh, uh, role in what we decide in life, I believe. I just didn't come across when I was a medical student, the role models that kept me engaged in that. It was at a time when it was becoming a uh, a female dominated field. It was a perception that women really wanted to see women as, as their physicians and that um, the men were becoming increasingly that I came in contact with were in, becoming increasingly disenchanted with litigation and were not happy with their, their, their station and role and profession. So I just didn't see enough sort of con- content, interested, passionate, individuals as role models. So I steered away from it. And then I was very late to orthopedics. I, um, I was probably a third year medical student. I said, Hey, you know, I rotated, I did a spine rotation and, um, I scrubbed in on spine surgery and the spine surgeon was amazing, just a really good role model. And I remember the case and I thought it was fascinating. And, um, that sort of transitioned me. It's not like most orthopedic surgeons. Most people who are, you know, they come out of the womb wanting to be an orthopedic surgeon and <laughs> it has that stereotype of, you know, you know, athletic, very male dominated field to this day for, and hoping that's something we're going to change, but it just, it, it, you kind of know, you could pick out the, 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 the people in your medical co- school class, that person's going to be an orthopedic surgeon and that person's going to be, you know, but I wasn't the person who was going to be an orthopedic surgeon. I was, I really try to keep an open mind. Um, and, and I was very, a, a late comer, but that was my evolution in terms of the things that I was particularly interested in. And I, and I think that's the way to do it too. Even, you know, a lot of residents listen to this, this podcast and, and a way to go and especially cho- choosing a fellowship and choosing whatever you want to do is just to kind of keep an open, open mind, everything. I think one of the, one, somebody I was talking to one day just kind of said, if you go take each rotation, like you, you want to do that field and that's the mindset that you have going into it, whatever you actually want to do will gravitate towards you. It seems like that's what it did with you as far as, you know, orthopedics and the spine. Well, you didn't go into spine, but orthopedics in, in general. Right. Right. And, and you mentioned, role models a couple of times, but to you, what is a good role model? What, what do they do and what, how do they have that effect on you? What do, what do they, what does that look like in your eyes? I think that, um, uh, I, I, I think of, uh, do you, do you know what a, a smorgasbord is? I've heard the term, but okay, I can, yeah. I, I've heard the term a before. A smorgasbord might be a German or Yiddish word. And, okay. uh, it, it sort of is a collection of all kinds of food. So think mm-hmm. about the uh, if you if you go to a, a, a I don't know an Asian restaurant where there was a, there was a dish they used to call the poo poo platter and the poo and I don't think it probably doesn't even exist anymore and probably <laughs> it's not even socially acceptable to say it but it was called the poo poo platter and the poo poo platter was it had every appetizer food uh, from a Chinese restaurant okay all okay. The, you know, the cultural delicacies so a smorgasbord is is sort of like you'd have every food group represented you know. And you wouldn't just have roast beef, but you could have corned beef, you could have pastrami, you could have ham, you could have turkey, right? So the point is that I think of um, mentors as uh, life's uh, smorgasbord. I, I would I encourage my residents to pick and choose the things when you get exposed to different individuals. You will you can probably almost always find some positive attribute in the way they conduct themselves the way they interact with their peers, the way they interact with people in the room, their level of self-awareness, their character, their honesty, their work ethic, um, just some uh, their skill, how they got their skill, uh, some attribute, and maybe pick and choose the attributes that are most important to you. And and you can collectively create and learn and, and, and move the needle or, 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 or advance yourself based upon those, those mentors and learn something from them. But truth be told, mentors are really people who an individual can identify with. And you don't have to identify with every attribute or every character trait. It's, it could be a very ephemeral, uh, non-objective, intangible thing that you identify an individual. You say, you know what? I would like to be like her. I would like to be like him. I would, be like, I would like to be like that. Um, and I see myself or something that I would like to become 
in that specific individual. And it, 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 it doesn't have to be one person or one character trait because as we learn and grow, I think mentors teach us things very specifically sometimes. And you can have a lot of mentors in your life and, and, and you can choose and grab the things that are most meaningful to you. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And, um, and one thing that I started to learn with time is that a mentor can be somebody that you may not even know. It may be a virtual mentor, somebody that you listen to on podcast or somebody uh, that books that you read from afar and you take this attribute or that attribute, or you, you like this thing um, about them and you kind of incorporate that into, into your life, or I guess smorgasbord, if I said that right. You said um, it right. You did good. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can kind of just incorporate that and, in, and, in, and in make that a part of yourself. Um, just moving forward. So, you know, we kind of spoke a little bit about your background, what made you get into med school and, and why you wanted to choose orthopedics. One thing I did find interesting looking at, you know, just reading up on you is that, you know, you're at the University of Chicago and you took a year off between your third and fourth year to get your MBA. Now, what I'm just kind of getting in your mindset at that time, what made you want to to make that uh, to, to go and do that? I had uh, virtually the only business class I ever took was introduction to business. And that might've been in fifth grade. And um, what I learned at the, in the nineties when I was uh, well, late eighties, nineties, when I was in training is that uh, being a physician is uh, doesn't afford the luxury to ignore all the, all the other aspects that are required to actually run a business. And I had essentially no, I had an interest in business and I always was very entrepreneurial. When I was younger, I had a, a, a handyman business called A to Z Handyman, where we would paint houses and build decks and seal driveways. And, and, and we, you know, I put my throat, I, I literally put myself through college and half of medical school through money earned when I was in high school doing that. We used to work oh, in wow. summers. Um, and and um, so I've always had a unique interest in business, but had no business acumen. And what I began to learn is that uh, early on that medicine was, uh, had certain vulnerabilities it was a time when the HMO, health maintenance organizations, which you may or may not be familiar with, were coming into this onto the scene and largely on the West Coast, and delivery models were changing. And it was uh, became very abundantly clear to me that in order to, like I alluded to before, sort of have some influence and control in decision making, you had to have knowledge. And I had no formal knowledge. And I was already accustomed to being a student. There was uh, maybe one other uh, student at that time from the University of Chicago who did the combined program. I remember speaking to him about it, and I felt that if I'm ever going to do it, this now would be the time as a medical student uh, to step out a year and to get one more additional year because I was already in debt. I was already accustomed to being a student. I was mobile. I didn't, you know, I was. I liked being a student, and I figured, what's one more year to get a knowledge base that uh, I wouldn't otherwise be able to acquire. Uh, right. arguably if someone was thinking about doing that today, I would say it's not the best time to do it, uh, from a knowledge point of view, because I really had no foundation and, um, other than a high level of interest. So it gave me credibility, a working vocabulary, but it certainly at the time didn't teach me how to be a CEO or to analyze financial statements. Those are things I learned much later that I honestly could possibly have done without, a, without an MBA. Uh, because I've always had an interest in that. I'm you know, currently the managing partner of our group. I've been involved with a number of startups. I have intellectual property. I do a lot of things outside of medicine uh, that are in the, in the business realm. Um, but that's not because I got my MBA. If I had, I'm now managing partner of our orthopedic group. If I, knowing the blind spot that I have now, I would probably benefit more today from taking the curriculum and selecting curriculum that would be appropriate for what I do today but didn't have that luxury. Then it was just health administration, which was just fine. So what did I get? I got an additional year of school. Uh, I got, I made some amazing contacts and friends that I still have today. And it gave me credibility and a working vocabulary and the ability to ask the right questions that I could later get answers to. So that's just to give you a little synopsis of the role of the MBA then and the role of the MBA now. And and just to quickly dive deeper, what are some of those questions that 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 you that you can now ask? Just just being curious. Well, um, um, I would say that it you know it's multifactorial. You know, um, early on, I needed to you know understand uh, how to what a contract looks like for a job for my job. 
Mm. Um, uh, but then more importantly, it really relates to how I wanted to build a practice. And, and there are a lot of elements to building a practice that's uh, professionally, emotionally, intellectually satisfying. And it's it, the first and foremost is just, you know, obviously the things that every physician wants is to be a good physician, to be a good decision maker, to do the right thing, to make a difference in someone's life. Uh, but the reality is running a practice, whether you're in a, a, a solo practitioner, you're within a group or you're a hospital employed physician, there are, it, it's all business and it's all financials. And it, it, you can't, you know, none of us really have the luxury other than some unique situations where you're truly hospital based, punch in, punch out. But very few of us have the luxury of just doing that and also having the opportunity to be successful. So I think the things that are really important are understanding the dynamic of building a practice of uh, being efficient, of being cost efficient, of understanding, you know, human resources and insurance and liability and, and asset protection and, and uh, all in life insurance and, and all of the things that relate to being a doctor, it's a job, by the way, that has all of those elements too. And you're no longer a student, you're a business person whose career and profession and, and, and craft is also being a doctor. But mm. it, it is absolutely categorically a business. And if you want to be viable, you have to treat it as a business. Otherwise, you don't have the luxury of, of, of practicing your craft. So for those listening to this now, that, that some are fellows and some are attendings that listen to this, but say um, for those that are listening to this, that want to learn some of those things that you're just talking about, you know, more about insurance, more about liability, how would you suggest they go about doing so? Would you suggest an online class? Would you just, just reading on it? Or what are some avenues that you would suggest somebody do, uh, you know, now in, in, these er- in this era? Yeah, so I, I think that uh, some of the best sources of information can come from the specialty societies. So for example, um, I'm the president of the Arthroscopy Association of North America. Um, I'm also very involved with the AOSSM, the Society for Sports Medicine and the Shoulder and Elbow Society. And all of these specialty societies offer curriculum at various times, often at their annual meetings and so forth, lectures on uh, marketing your, uh, your, your practice, uh, building your uh, your online uh, uh, footprint, um, uh, navigating contracts, value-based care, ambulatory uh, verticals or ancillary such as building, you know, the, 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 the ancillary or vertical structure of ambulatory surgery centers and MRI and PT and CT and, and DME and all those things about a practice. So I would say that the, the specialty societies uh, leverage their members who are very good at this to provide curriculum. There are books on marketing your clinical practice. Neil Baum is a wonderful author who has written a number of books on, on marketing your practice. Um, there is, I would say, though, that there, the, our specialty at orthopedic surgery is not replete with resources. I would say, first and foremost, some of the, way to get, the ways to get it from an efficiency point of view would be to turn to the meetings that offer these carve-out didactic sessions that have content in this area. Uh, your internet reputation, social media, um, uh, uh, creating bundles in, in, in healthcare. It depends how deep you want to go. Many of us are in infrastructures where we don't have to learn how to put together a bundle for an ACL reconstruction and ambulatory surgery center. Uh, but we also want to learn how to, how to promote our practice, how to develop a, 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 a presence through social media in an ethical, ethically responsible way. The resources, I think, can often be found at the level of specialty societies. Perfect. And uh, I think that's a perfect transition to our next talk, you know, because you just talk about, you know, a lot of these different societies. You know, your current president of ANA, um, your head team physician for numerous teams, uh, chairman of surgery where you work at, you, you've been the head of multiple societies. Can you kind of tell me the story of what made you want to pursue all these leadership position in, you know, in all these different organizations? Um, that's a, it should, it's a, it's a, it's a, I'll try to hone in on, you know, the, the core to give you a proper answer. Sure. You yeah, know, whatever you uh, want. Physicians, physicians are inherently, uh, uh, ego sensitive and ego deprived. Uh, I guess for lack of a better expression, um, we go into medicine and, uh, we participate in a, a feedback loop that is reinforcing. 
someone comes to you with a problem, you have a solution, you have a way, a path to deliver that solution, the patient achieves a, a positive outcome, they are gratified and satisfied, and you feel the benefits of doing something good. There's, there's, no, there's no monetary association with that. There's, there's no price tag for that. That's priceless and the core of why most people go into medicine. Even today, despite various stereotypes of millennials and all these other things and work ethic, the reality is people stay in medicine because they enjoy being part of that feedback loop. So that can be very infectious. That can, be, um, that can also take you out of balance. That can cause not knowing when to say no, for example, is a particularly, uh, that's a difficult challenge that many of us have. Um, I think that when people succeed in leadership, it's because they have a passion to take that core, that nidus that I just described to you, the satisfaction that comes from being a, a, a good a, a good doctor um, can extend to being a good uh, a good peer for those around who you also respect who can learn something. So I thought I think when leadership leadership at the level of societies and so forth begins with a willingness to sort of have academic philanthropy, to be willing to spend time doing research, to be willing to, that's non-renumerative, to be willing to teach others because you, because you want to share knowledge and also learn from others. We're, we have the luxury of always being a student. And then if you're good at it and you are timely and you are, deliver and you don't waste people's time and you, and you um, are uh, known to be reliable and effective and efficient in how you do things, not perfect, but efficient because perfection is, can be the enemy of good as we know, mm, but right. not sloppy and not careless and thoughtful. Um, I think it puts you in a position where others will continue to ask you to deliver because it, it benefits the system as a whole, but it's a bit of an art form. It, it's something that I've gotten better at over time. I was I would argue that I was not a good leader as I was younger. I would argue that I frankly lacked the humility necessary to be a good leader. I would argue that I lacked self-awareness necessary to be a good leader. I would argue that I'm far from perfect today, but I would say that life's lessons as I've aged um, and accumulated uh, experience have made me more fit for that role. And it's not about being at the top. It's not about those beneath you. It's about um, uh, collective decision-making that takes an entire organization or a group of individuals where you together sort of rise to the top. So I think that being leader has to sort of remove the, we always say that there's no I in team. Uh, there's another expression that if you look at the word team, T-E-A-M, uh, there's a... a if you look at it spelled out, there's, there's this expression where there's an a-hole in the middle of it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so you have to be very careful about when you're in these positions that it really, I think, isn't about you and let down, let down your ego and engender others to, to help you know, foster the team. None of us, I think, are successful because of what we do individually. And that's what I've learned from a number of my mentors. Um, I think the concept of surrounding yourself by people who are as good or even more uh, optimally better than you are some of the ways that good leaders succeed. Uh, there's a number of other things. There's people I've turned to like Colin Powell and other amazing leaders who have just very strong messaging on decision-making and when to make a decision and when to uh, strive for perfection or less than perfection and still make a decision. Those are, there's a lot of important tenets, but I would just say that being in a position of, of sort of guiding and uh, collaborating is nothing more than an extension of just being frankly a doctor where you start out saying, I get great pleasure from doing a good job and making a difference in someone's life. And I'll tell you, I don't know how old you are, how many years you've been in practice, uh, but that's something as a surgeon early on in your career, you're going to focus on doing, and I want to do something. And it might be technical because you're a surgeon, but what you'll realize is that you will, every year you'll become a better and better surgeon. But more importantly, you're going to become more comfortable being in the office and identifying with a, an individual, figuring out why they're there, what they want, 
and gleaning the satisfaction of actually making a difference in someone's life. And even 24 years in practice, 80% of what I do is non-surgical, but I've learned quite frankly to sort of relish those, those, those uh, experiences. Uh, surgery is, is the easy part. It's everything else that is embodied there. And I would say that that satisfaction, that gratification extends to being in positions of leadership because you get to work with a lot of really bright people and you feel very good about the process, not because you're sitting at the podium on top. It's because you're part of a process that helps everyone to do, to, to be better at what they do. Yeah. I love that answer. I think that's a great answer. You know, um, noting that, you know, there's this common themes that you mentioned throughout while you're talking. One is knowing that you're not at the top and it's more a collaborative effort and it's more of a team effort. And some of the things just to point out that you mentioned that I've heard and said in, in other podcasts or just reading other things or the ability to make a decision or when to make a decision, how to make a decision, surrounding yourself with a team of people that are even better than you. And, and, and it's almost just like you just said, making a, uh, making a process. They say, you know, good leaders, uh, when they're gone, the, they're, they're the process that they've, that have helped to maintain can still go on without them. And, and that they can be seen not leading from behind, not leading from behind telling people what to do, but doing it with people. And just like you said, a lot of these things, take a little bit of while, take a while to, uh, to happen. I think you mentioned that at some point you lacked humility and self-awareness. Uh, can you tell me about a time at the beginning where, where you struggled as a leader, you know, maybe a story of, of something that happened. Um, but, but at a time when you, when you, when you struggled and what that kind of looked like. Um, I think that when you're early in your career, when you're early in your education process and you want to go into orthopedics um, you recognize, like I alluded to before, that you need to try really hard and be successful. You have to get good grades. You have to be good at it. You feel like you have to be good at everything you do in order to be, to achieve the proper credit to get into medical school and then to get a residency and then to get a fellowship. It's a, it is a very vertical climb. And there are a lot of shortcomings in the process because I think it breeds uh, behaviors that once you get there are not necessarily needed, uh, quite frankly. In fact, I think they're counterproductive. But the system is such that it's become sufficiently objective with some intangibles, but sufficiently objective that if you don't meet certain thresholds, you're just not going to get there. No matter how much you want it, if you don't meet those objectives, you will be excluded. So those behaviors, I think, breed a sense of, um, of I, I don't know if it's isolationism, if it's, if it's um, but it, it just breeds behaviors that you just got to keep your nose down and work really hard. And along with that, I think you tend to, you, you're just not, you lose a certain part of balance at that time of your, of your, of the process that really just you're not in situations where you are interacting with people at the level that you do when you're out in in, in your career you just th- th- those opportunities are just not as robust once you get there you have the privilege of actually exercising those things and experiencing and so i think that when i think of the the, the concept of humility so I, I think that early on i just wasn't aware of my surroundings and i think i was a victim of the situation and wasn't insightful enough to really understand the bigger picture because I was, I was just head down. Okay. Just for lack of a better term. And um, I think that humility is not something that you're born with. It's something that you earn or acquire through life's experiences. And I would argue that I was very blessed that while I still had to pay largely pay my way through college and you know, economically wasn't just given everything when I was a kid, that was fine. I never, that was not something that I longed for. I didn't feel underprivileged. I didn't feel like I went without, I had all the things I needed, but I still had to do a lot to, um, to get through the process financially. And um, I was, I would say that the humility component because I didn't have any huge challenges as a kid, I didn't have any huge challenges as a young adult. 
the challenges came later on through just life's events that helped me recognize that I was probably not the most prepared to deal with certain high level challenges at first. It's interesting when you meet people in life who really had an uphill climb, you know, who needed scholarship, who needed to work two jobs and go to school, who potentially had a sick parent or a sick sibling, or they themselves were sick or had some really traumatic event when they were younger. When you meet these people and you talk to them, you often find that they are the most equipped to deal with challenges as a, as an adult. Yeah. I would say that I was blessed to the extent that I didn't have any magnanimous challenge that I can recall that threw me on my heels. Those things happen later on. And by every sense of the word, they weren't irreversible. They weren't, they weren't uh, so magnanimous that I couldn't overcome them, but I did need to dig deep to figure out how to manage those things. And um, I would say that I was ill-prepared, but I, with resources, I was able to figure it out. And um, the lessons of having some type of challenge, however you want to perceive that challenge, whatever they happened, I think can steer you in a, in a different direction to the point where you become more self-aware you maybe value things differently. You may look at balance differently. They, it teaches you things that you just didn't consider before because you just didn't have that class. I never had a class on certain things when I was younger, but I got schooled later on in my early late thirties, early forties in various things. And they were instrumental enough that it impacted me to a level that I think I just became a, 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 a more complete person, if you will. And, and, and there's no value judgment I ever have on any individual with that. It's just you do meet people throughout your career who maybe you think are not self-aware, and I never have a value judgment. I don't think people are meant – they mean to be mean or off-putting or, or not have compassion or awareness. They're often a function of their environment. The good news is that we are always able – we can always be students in life, and, and we can always learn something. And that's the greatest thing about – doing what we do, being an orthopedic surgeon. And if you have an interest in academics or other, even if you don't, we never stop learning. And while I may not learn a new technique uh, next month, I might learn a new way to handle something interpersonally with a patient or a, a situation with someone in the industry or, or other that makes me, I think, better at who I am and what I do. So I guess the the, 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 the summary is that Humility and self-awareness are not something we're born with. They are things that you earn as we age based upon life experiences. And it can happen at any time. I think it's good to happen sooner than later, but that any time it'll be a challenge. But when it happens, I think it makes us all better. So I, 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 I hope I articulated that well enough to, to give some message. No, you did. And, and, and kind of the, almost a word that I'm, I'm thinking of in my head is kind of resiliency or being able to kind of bounce back after, you know, being hit down after being hit or, 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 you know, getting some type of change, you know, they always hear it in sports. You, you whenever you fall down you get back up and it's kind of the, the same mindset to have, you know, through life. Cause we all have times where uh, we'll be challenged in some sort of way or others. And this is how you kind of overcome those challenges is, and and the things that you learn from those are, are kind of the things that help you throughout your, throughout your life and 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 how to um, deal with challenges in the future or, or when things go wrong. You know, even it, people may be listening. Even something goes wrong in the OR, and they they learn something back in years ago. You know, they learn how to be calm and and objectively uh, figure out what's going on in the situation and move forward from there. But uh, I, I think it all kind of comes back now to resiliency and. Um, and trying to be more self-aware, um, all all things that, that you alluded to, uh, you know, in your answer. And I thought it was very well thought out. I don't know if it was thought out or you're just going on top of your head, but it sounded great. So it was well, a great no, answer. I mean, I, I, these are things I've thought about. I've had to articulate before. And I, you know, I, I have to work with residents and fellows and adults. And, you know, I mean, I think that they're just, I mean, we all have something to bring to the table. As I said, it's like mentorship, you know, and uh, those are things that, that, 
were really instrumental in sort of me, I think, becoming and emerging. And you know what? Talk to me in 10 years. You know, God willing, I, I could be a very different person, you know, and hopefully you know, with, with, with even, you know, more insider strengths. So. Great. Uh, well, Dr. Cole, it's been a it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Really appreciate you coming on the podcast and and, and speaking and and you know telling us a little bit more and sharing a little bit more of your life. Um, at the end of our podcast, we always give a way for our listeners to follow you if they want to. It can be social media, uh, just a way to reach out to you or follow you and see things you have going on. If you want to share any of your social media with our listeners, yeah, I would love to. So I think that um, you know my the easiest way. You know, I'm on. Uh, uh, Instagram, Instagram at Brian Cole, MD. Instagram, mm-hmm. Instagram at Brian Cole, MD. I'm on uh, Facebook, uh, and, uh, Twitter, you know, we, I have a, a, a podcast and a radio show we've been doing for 12 years now. Um, uh, that is, um, uh, called sports medicine weekly. And, um, I'd love it if our, if your listeners would tune into our, our podcast, uh, we have over Definitely. 500 episodes of, you know, things related to all things, sports medicine talks with professional athletes. Uh, injury recovery, uh, things of that nature, nutrition, uh, health awareness, you know, and, you know, I think podcasts have become a really efficient way, uh, much more so than a, a lot of other vehicles to, to help educate people. So I would love it if people would, uh, you know, certainly tune in, but at Brian Cole MD. And I think honestly, my website is probably the best place to go because it's kind of all there. And that's uh, Brian Cole MD.com. So uh, pretty, pretty easy to remember, BrianColeMD.com. And I appreciate the opportunity and congratulations on your podcast and all of your success. Oh, well, we appreciate it. And everybody listening, until next time, please hit that subscribe button. And uh, don't forget to go and leave a review and tell us how much you enjoyed this episode.